Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Nokia's first quarter 2024 results call. I'm David Mulholland, head of Nokia Investor Relations, and today with me is Pekka Lundmark, our president and CEO, along with Marco Varen, our CFO. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer. During this call, we will be making forward-looking statements regarding your future business and financial performance, and these statements are predictions that involve risks and uncertainties. Actual results may therefore differ materially from the results we currently expect. Factors that can cause such differences can be both external as well as internal operating factors. We have identified such risks in the risk factor section of our annual report on Form 20F, which is available on our Investor Relations website. Within today's presentation, references to growth rates will mainly be on a cost and currency basis, and margins will be referring to our comparable reporting. Please note that our Q4 report and a presentation that accompanies the call are published on our website. This report includes both rep reported and comparable financial results and a reconciliation between the two. In terms of the agenda for today, Pekka will go through the key messages from the quarter, Marco will go through the financial performance in a bit more detail, and then Pekka will make a few comments on a couple of particular highlights in the quarter, and we'll then move to Q&A. With that, let me hand over to Pekka. <clears throat> Thanks, David, and thank you all for dialing in today. We said back in January that we expected a challenging environment in the first half of this year, and that's what we saw in Q1. Our net sales declined 19% year-on-year in constant currency, as the weak spending environment that started to take hold in Q2 last year remained with us. This impacted the profitability of our three networks businesses, but was offset by the benefit of deals signed in Nokia Technologies and the ongoing cost reductions. Marco will go into more detail shortly about our financial performance in the quarter. You may also recall that we started to talk about improved order intake trends in Q4, particularly in our network infrastructure business. I'm pleased to say that this has continued in Q1. We have seen good growth in order intake year on year, and the book to bill in network infrastructure was above one. The outlook for fixed networks has improved over the past three months, which is, in, which is important as this is often the market rec that recovers first in our business. However, it might take somewhat longer for our optical networks business to recover. With the continued order intake strength, I remain confident that we will see a stronger second half performance and that for the full year, our network infrastructure business will return to growth. We have also been executing quickly on our cost reduction program, where we target to achieve between 800 million and 1.2 billion euro in cost savings by 2026. We are well on track with many actions already taken in Q4 and Q1 to achieve the total 500 million euro of in-year savings in 2024. 400 million of this relates to the new program we announced in October. One of the biggest highlights from Q1 is the three smartphone licensing deals that we signed. I'm delighted we have now concluded our smartphone licensing renewal cycle and we'll have no more major renewals for a number of years. With these deals, we now have an annual net sales run rate of approximately 1.3 billion euro in Nokia technologies. We have also benefited from over 400 million euro of catch-up net sales in the quarter related to these deals. Nokia Technologies team will now focus their efforts on expanding in new growth areas, and we have a promising pipeline to help us deliver on our next target to increase our run rate to 1.4 to 1.5 billion euro in the midterm. Finally, we saw strong free cash flow from generation. Uh, we saw strong free cash flow generation in the quarter with almost 1 billion euro of free cash flow. Along with the benefits in operating profit that we saw from the deal signed in Nokia Technologies, we have also seen some unwind of the working capital investment we made over the past two years related to the supply chain challenges and some growth opportunities we had. So overall, the first half of 2024 will remain challenging in our networks businesses, but with the improving order trends, progress made in Nokia Technologies and our quick action on cost we remain solidly on track to achieve our full year outlook. With that, let me hand it over to Marco to go through the financial performance in more detail. Thanks, Becca, and good morning from my side as well. As mentioned, we saw a weak start of 24, 
with a 19% decline in our net sales as the challenging environment of the second half of 23 remained with us. Our gross margin improved significantly year on year to 48.6%, and this is due to a combination of an improved gross margin in mobile networks and deals we signed in Nugget Technologies. Our operating margin also benefited from these deals, which offset low profitability in our networks businesses. Free cash flow generation was strong in the quarter as a result of the Nokia Technologies catch-up payments and working capital improvements. This means that we ended the quarter with a net cash balance of 5.1 billion. And I will now take you through the individual performances of the business groups. And in network infrastructure, sales declined by 26% compared to a very strong year ago quarter, where we still benefited from supply chain catch up. I would also call out that in the quarter we saw a 23% year on year decline in submarine networks. And this was related to a project timing, along with some destruction given ongoing Red Sea conflict. We continued to sign new deals that increased our backlog in submarine, Gross margin declined slightly because of lower net sales coverage and less favorable business mix, and this flowed through to operating margin. As Pekka highlighted, order trends improved again in the quarter, which gives continued confidence that quarter one will mark the low point from a net sales perspective, and that the business will see stronger trends into the second half of 24. This is supporting the assumption that network infrastructure will return to growth on a constant currency basis in full year 24. <clears throat> and turning to mobile networks. As you recall, our first half of 23 was driven by significant 5G deployments in India that then started to normalize in the second half of last year. And this means that we face a very challenging comparison in the first half of this year. And this combined with ongoing low levels of activity in North America led to 37% net sales decline in the quarter. We do expect that quarter one will represent the low point of net sales in both India and North America in 24. We saw a strong increase in cross margins, which was 42.4% uh, in the quarter. And half of that year-on-year -year increase was a result of positive regional and product mix, and the reminder was due to exceptionally low indirect cost of sales, which we expect to normalize going forward. Operating margin declined due to low net sales coverage. And cloud and network services also saw a soft start of the year, but we are seeing improving order intake and pipeline momentum also in this business. And our full year assumptions remain unchanged. Cross margin increased by 310 basis points in the quarter, thanks to a favorable product mix and regional mix. Operating margin declined compared to prior year due to a lower net sales coverage. And as a reminder, in quarter four, we announced the sale of our device management and service management businesses to Lumine. And this transaction has now closed and will have a modest impact on CNS in quarter two and onwards. To give you some context, the business was generating more than 100 million uh, euro of annual sales with good profitability. <clears throat> and then briefly on Nokia Technologies. We were very pleased to see the conclusion of the smartphone renewal cycle, which brought with it over 400 million in catch-up payments in the quarter. And this increased our run rate from 900 million to 1 billion, which we had at the end of the quarter four, to 1.3 billion we currently have. And now the next goal is to increase our licensing net sales run rate to 
between 1.4 to 1.5 billion in the midterm as we grow in the other areas that Pekka will explain later. And then the regional picture was as expected with significant decline in India, which had completed a large deployment in 23. Similarly, the North American decline reflected continuation of low levels of deployment that we saw during the second half of 23. And elsewhere, we largely saw declines in most regions, reflecting the ongoing weak market environment, while we continued to see growth in Middle East and Africa. And finally, on cash. You can see from the chart here that the dual impact of the catch-up payments in Nokia Technologies and the release of working capital led to a generation of almost one billion of free cash flow. We also reduced the level of sale of receivables in the quarter, and we therefore, therefore ended the quarter with a 5.1 billion net cash and are on track to achieve our targeted free cash flow conversion of 30 to 60%. And with that, let me hand you back over to Pekka. Thank you, Marco. Firstly, I want to touch on fixed networks. We are the market leader with over 40% market share globally, excluding China and OLT products. With our product portfolio and the ability to offer customers a roadmap to deploy GPON, XGSPON, and 25GPON in the same line card, we have a compelling value proposition. Customers can also upgrade to 50G and 100G in the same chassis down the line with our Lightspan FM, MF14 platform. We also launched new ONT products for 25G in the first quarter. These ONTs support both business as well as residential applications. Looking then at market dynamics, it's important to remember that globally excluding China, over 70% of homes are still not connected by fiber, and there is a significant opportunity remaining in our biggest markets of both North America and Europe. In North America, we are now seeing some stabilization in demand as inventory positions have improved, and we see the bid funding program progressing well, which we will still expect will start to benefit in the second half and more meaningfully in 2025. In Europe, we see deployments remaining at a high level in markets with low penetration, and we are seeing some mature markets starting to upgrade to XGS PON and 25G PON. We are also seeing good momentum and growth opportunities this year in many of our other regions for fixed networks. Next, I wanted to highlight our optical networks business as we had a number of important launches in the quarter. New services and applications are driving significant increases in optical network capacity to the metro edge. Therefore, we have expanded our optical portfolio to address these needs. In March, we announced the expansion of our pluggable coherent optics portfolio to now include 100, 400, and 800 gigabit per second transceivers. We also introduced new interface cards and chassis that bring scale and efficiency to Metro Edge applications that serve a diverse set of networking functions needed by our various customer types. In both IP and optical networking, we are clearly recognized as a market leader. This means we are uniquely positioned to serve the evolving needs of our customers in an unbiased way as they consider various converged IP optical network architecture alternatives. This truly differentiates us from the competition as typically they only have scale in either IP or optical. I now wanted to provide a few words on our mobile networks business and our portfolio. Firstly, you can see in the charts, our products now deliver market leading throughput performance. A few years ago, we were behind on live networks performance for 5G. If you look at performance in live networks today, those cities that use our products are delivering better downlink performance and slightly better uplink performance than our competitors. With each generation of software release, we continue to improve on this. Secondly, we offer customers the greatest flexibility in terms of deployment for their networks. Operators are looking at opportunities to virtualize 
and optimize their network deployments. With our AnyRAM approach, we offer the greatest flexibility in compute platform between different servers, CPUs, and even cloud platforms for their baseband deployments, all while maintaining feature parity with our purpose-built baseband solutions. Finally, we remain the most committed and engaged of the traditional equipment vendors to ORAN. We are the largest contributor to developing the open interfaces with a transparent roadmap on product availability. We have completed operability with five different radio suppliers. This has also been helping us commercially with deals signed with Deutsche Telekom and Entity Docomo last year, along with the deal we signed in February with Rakuten. The next topic I wanted to talk about is how we are helping operators address their two biggest challenges, automating their operations and reducing OPEX as network complexity grows, and also how they can monetize their 5G networks. Let me explain how our technology enables this in a way that nobody else in the market is doing. Regarding automation, we have the capability to drive zero-touch autonomous operations across all network domains. We manage autonomous operations across multi-vendor networks, meaning that we are providing this service management and orchestration in customer networks that combine multiple vendors <clears throat> rather than only orchestrating our own networks. This has been helping us to win against the competition and benefits from our position of having first-hand knowledge and deep expertise across RAN, transport, core, and the many different capabilities you see on the slide. On the monetization side, our holistic solution is what also enables network programmability and the ability for CSPs to expose their APIs to developers using our network as code platform. This is a key point, and we already have 11 operator agreements for our platform. To fully benefit from the emerging network APIs, CSPs need their operations to be fully automated because the API paradigm assumes an application interacts directly with the network in real time. In fact, we have customers who are purchasing our autonomous operations specifically to accelerate their API exposure strategy. Secure autonomous operations also underpin the ability to achieve network slicing at scale, which is another 5G monetization vehicle. To conclude, we have a highly differentiated solution for orchestration, which enables our customers to monetize their networks and run secure autonomous operations to address their biggest challenges in a way that none of our competitors can do. I also wanted to highlight some partnerships that we announced in the quarter that will benefit both our mobile networks and cloud and network services businesses. At Mobile World Congress, we announced a strategic partnership with Dell. On the Nokia side, we will now adopt Dell as our preferred infrastructure partner for existing Nokia airframe customers, which will enable us to refocus our R&D efforts into areas where we can really differentiate as Nokia. Secondly, our private wireless solution, NDAC, or Nokia Digital Automation Cloud, will become Dell's preferred private wireless platform for enterprise customers. And we can see this becoming a very powerful channel to further drive growth in private wireless. We also announced a partnership with NVIDIA that will help us to broaden the compute platforms we support with our AnyRAN solution that I talked about earlier for cloud run deployments. This will help us to accelerate the opportunities to bring AI capabilities into the RAN network. We will also partner with NVIDIA on some elements of 6G research. And finally, in Nokia Technologies, as a quick reminder of some of the new growth areas we are now focusing on. We have been making strong progress in more developed areas like automotive and consumer electronics. You can see on the slide some of the recent deal examples here. We also see areas like IoT and multimedia as strong opportunities where we are in active negotiations, but the markets are still in the early stages of development. In multimedia, for example, we have a strong patent portfolio covering multiple technologies, including video compression, content delivery, content recommendation, and aspects related to hardware. In these areas, we see a promising pipeline to increase our licensing net sales run rate. 
So to conclude, while the market weakness remains, we do see improving order trends giving us confidence that we will return to growth in the second half of the year, particularly in network infrastructure. We have now concluded the smartphone renewal cycle, which allows Nokia Technologies to enter a period of stability and can therefore focus its efforts on the expansion areas we discussed. The deal signed also contributed to the strong cash generation we saw in Q1. In the meantime, we will continue to execute on our cost savings plans to optimize margins during this weaker environment while maintaining our commitment to R&D investment. These cost actions, along with the expected improvements in net sales into the second half of the year, give us confidence that we are solidly on track to deliver our outlook for 2024. So with that, let me pass you back to David, who will introduce the Q&A section of the call. Thank you, Tucker and Mark, for the presentation. The Q&A session, as a courtesy to others, thank you. Could you please limit yourself to one question and a brief follow-up? George, can you please give the instructions? We will now begin the question and answer session. If you are also viewing the video webcast, please remember to mute the audio on your computer before asking your question, as there is a 30-second delay. To ask a question, you may press star and one on your telephone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up the handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star and two. I will now hand the call back to Mr. David Maholland. Thanks, George. We'll take our first question today from Artem Polecki from SEB. Artem, please go ahead. Uh, yes, hi, and thank you for taking my question. I actually would like to pick uh, some further thoughts from you regarding full year guidance. So, so looking at Q1 development, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, what comes to network segments, so there has been a bit steeper decline than uh, what you have suggested initially, but at the same time you are quite uh, positive what comes to order situation. Could you maybe comment on balance? Uh, are you more confident what comes to full year guidance and outlook uh, versus previously, for example, uh, in accordance with Q4 results? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Artem. Um, well, first of all, as I already said, uh, we saw some positive order trends already in Q4, especially network infrastructure, and uh, we were pleased to see that those trends uh, continued uh, in Q1. And then, uh, in addition to NI, uh, we also commented that order trends in CNS were positive in Q1, and this is not only only orders that we have, but this also led it to the pipeline of new opportunities that we are uh, seeing. So obviously, it's hard to give a simple answer on the confidence uh, uh, level, but uh, nothing has really changed. I mean, we remain confident on the full year forecast. We are obviously three months into into the year, and the trends are largely playing out from order intake perspective, as we would have uh, hoped. There is always some variability between quarters and in NI you saw that uh, our kind of uh, comments were now a bit more positive on uh, fixed networks and a bit more cautious on optical networks but as a whole uh, nothing has changed uh, from uh, Q4. Did you have a follow-up Artem? Uh, yes indeed and uh, the quick follow-up is indeed related to fixed networks and uh, as you mentioned uh, the outlook for this year has improved uh, could you maybe uh, elaborate a bit uh, where from it is coming? Is it a big program, more broad-based uh, inventory situation as you see it right now and so on? It, it, it's actually a combination of those. I mean, uh, the outlook in North America uh, is looking more positive. Uh, now we have some, uh, some uh, uh, exciting fixed wireless access developments uh, in Asia, uh, Pacific. Uh, it's fairly broad-based. Uh, and when it comes to bid, uh, of course, I mean, that is a uh, long-term development, uh, so you will see some benefit from that in the second half of the year, but then even more into uh, 25 and 26. Thanks, Orson. We'll take our next question from Daniel Gerberg um, from Handelsbank. Daniel, please go ahead. Thank you, David, and good morning, uh, Marco and uh, Pekka. Uh, I will have a question a little bit on the uh, organization's changes that you did, uh, starting from uh, Q4, but uh, to be, uh, took place uh, officially from start of the year. A little bit mm -hmm. of reshuffling, I guess, and also in, in C-level managers, etc. 
Uh, how has this impacted the operations in Q1? And uh, should we expect this to, if it has, uh, uh, is it now settled and uh, uh, so the focus can be on customer going forward? Thanks. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Good morning. Good morning. The uh, reshuffling of the organization has uh, has been completed. We did it very quickly. Quickly, uh, it uh, was uh, put into force in the uh, in the beginning of the year. We basically used Q4 for planning. The old organization remained in place all Q4, and then overnight, in on the on January 1st, uh, the new organization was put in place. Obviously, there is uh, when you do this type of a reshuffle. Of course, there is a period of uh, uh, instability, but we are already behind uh, that, and now we are seeing the new organization has uh, has uh, started to uh, accumulate uh, uh, speed and get a more gain more and more uh, traction. What I do want to emphasize is that uh, when we talk about uh, the business groups uh, being more autonomous and uh, also running sales, uh, a very important principle also in the new model is that for all key customers, there is always an account executive that is responsible for our overall strategy and relationship with the customer uh, being one part of the role and then the second part of the role being the coordination of all multi-business group topics uh, for that uh, uh, customer. So this is important to note that uh, we are not approaching these customers in silos. Uh, the purpose of this whole thing uh, as I communicated also earlier, is to really to bring the customers closer to the decision makers of our businesses and the people that make decisions on the solutions that we bring to the market and people that sit on the crucial R&D resources. We want to shorten the distance between the customer and the business decision makers and uh, really place highly empowered uh, teams uh, in front of the customer. Have a follow up, yeah, I can take a quick one on uh, mobile networks. Um, do you did you have any you know uh, uh, contract breach fines from AT and T or something in the in the numbers, or should we expect uh, anything of, like that uh, to materialize ahead? Thanks. Uh, there were no such elements in the Q1 uh, numbers. Uh, when it comes to the AT&T situation, we do not have any updates at this stage. Uh, uh, negotiations are uh, still ongoing with respect to the conclusion of the existing contract. Thanks, Daniel. We'll take our next question from Alexander Duval from Goldman Sachs. Alex, please go ahead. Yes, thanks so much, uh, David, for the question. Um, firstly, uh, you referenced uh, ORAN uh, solutions. Uh, in your prepared remarks. So I think one of your competitors are talk, is talking about seeing increased market activity uh, in that area. So I was just curious if you're seeing a greater prevalence of ORAN requests in deal discussions, and if so, whether that has any implications for your R&D roadmap. Uh, and second of all, just um, to come back on uh, NI, I uh, just wondered if you could um, help uh, sort of understand the degree of visibility you have there. Um, obviously, you've talked about some improvement in orders. Um, however, last year, I think um, there was a sort of very positive outlook at the start of the year, and then through the year, things became more tricky on that side. Um, so just wondered if something has changed this year, um, which would be the sort of key positive drivers that give you uh, confidence on the visibility there. Many thanks. Okay, thank you. The, if I take the Oren question first, so uh, the interest is gradually uh, increasing, and um, and uh, uh, I think it's a good good thing. We are, as you know, we have been from the beginning a strong supporter of Oren, the strongest contributor to the uh, standard. We have uh, uh, several uh, real customer implementations, commercial implementations underway. And we are clearly the leader as to the company, all the companies who have tested and demonstrated interoperability between us, our solutions and other vendor solutions. So uh, we are welcoming the increased interest on Oran, and we believe that uh, that uh, we are uh, fully uh, competitive, um, regardless uh, which of the scenarios in terms of Oran speed will uh, materialize. Of course, part of this is also also, the other aspect of network evolution development, which is the cloudification of the, especially the basement functions 
of the network. And uh, there, I can say the same thing. This is, of course, a different thing from the open frontal interface that Oren will bring, but often these two will coexist in the future, and we are equally pleased to be uh, clearly one of the leaders uh, in the cloud and development um, as well. Exciting initiatives going on with uh, multiple customers um, uh, in different parts um, uh, of the world. Um, then when it comes to the um, NI, of course, a very important thing to note there, which we have said earlier, but I do repeat it also here, is that 2023 was kind of an exception because there was in Q1, as you remember, more than 15% uh, margin, operating margin in NI because of the catch-up deliveries that we had uh, that went that came from the supply chain shortages that uh, that affected volumes in uh, 2022. So there were two things uh, then uh, that happened in 23. Operators network build out phase, uh, slow, pace slowed down. And on top of that, they consumed uh, a lot of the inventories that they had built. And then, then we were uh, recovering from the supply chain situation. So the dynamics of 2023 were really, really exceptional. And this year we are we are moving back to a much more uh, kind of normal seasonality where Q1 is the weakest and then gradually it improves towards, uh, towards a stronger second half and then Q4 being the strongest. So this is what we are expecting this year. And the good thing is that, that the order trends that we uh, see in NI, uh, they started to support this already in Q4 last year and those trends have continued in the first uh, quarter uh, of this year, especially in fixed networks in North America, in uh, fixed wireless action, in fixed wireless action, uh, access, for example, with a significant customer in Asia, Asia Pacific. In IP networks, we continue to see tailwinds in uh, uh, the second half of the year from enterprise and web scale uh, winds. And as I said, it now seems that in optical networks, the recovery could take a little bit longer than originally expected. This is consistent with, with what some of our optical networks competitors have uh, commented. And then maybe finally on submarine networks, uh, there we are executing on a strong backlog. So the weak delivery, so weak top line in Q1 was more related to uh, project timing uh, impact in Q1 than the strength of the order backlog. And in addition to the order backlog in submarine, there is a strong pipeline of new opportunities as well. So maybe there's there is some ammunition to deal with your address your question with these things that I went through. Thanks, Alex. We'll take our next question from Sebastian Stabovitz from <laughs> Kepler Shiva. Sebastian, please go ahead. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, on mobile networks, uh, you started also the year on a very uh, soft path, and you need to accelerate strongly your revenue growth in the next few quarters to reach your guidance minus ten, minus fifteen. What kind of visibility do you have on the acceleration of sales growth uh, in mobile networks? And the uh, second question is on uh, the U.S. market, specifically in mobile. Uh, it seems the, the environment remained depressed in the first quarter. Uh, when do you expect the inventory correction or, uh, to be completed or the demand uh, to be back in the U.S. market in mobile networks? Thank you. The Q1 was, of course, very weak from a top line perspective. This was largely because of India. Uh, and uh, again, here you have to remember what happened last year, especially the first half of uh, 2023 saw a massive 5G deployment uh, in India. And now those volumes have uh, normalized. Uh, we do expect that uh, the low volumes in both India and North America in Q1 will improve. Uh, then uh, in the coming uh, quarters. And this is based on, obviously, a combination of the visibility that we have through order backlog and then also also the discussions on the pipeline that we have uh, uh, with these um, uh, customers. So we do maintain uh, the uh, 10 to 15 percent uh, decline expectation in mobile networks um, uh, for the year. Uh, the second question was, the inventory levels in North America. Do you want to take yeah, that, Yeah, I can Marco? take that one. Yeah. Um, uh, as we said last year in quarter four as well, that uh, the inventory level issue was more on 23 issue, and, and it's much less an issue this year. Um, the What we see now in North America is that, of course, the macroeconomic 
environment is also an, uh, impacting our customers' investment levels, and, and um, uh, we will see this uh, uh, during this year as well. And, and uh, uh, but we'll, we'll also mention that quarter one is exceptionally low, and, and we see um, uh, that this is a low point of uh, mobile networks um, uh, top line as well. Thanks, Sebastian. We'll take our next question from Sami Sarkamis from Danske Bank. Sami, please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I have a question regarding your balance sheet. It's looking uh, quite overcapitalized uh, relative to your net cash target range. And uh, if you think about the share buyback programs uh, you have decided for this year, next year, for 600 million euros, that's unlikely to kind of like fix the overcapitalization, overcapitalization issue. Are you willing to revisit uh, the share buyback program decision before 26, as uh, I think you may be in a position to buy back more than, than the 600 million that has been decided already? Yeah, thank you, Sami. And, and um, yes, we are. Uh, we had a very good cash generation this year in quarter one, and, and um, about one billion, and, and the net cash is at 5.1 billion at the moment. Uh, we will uh, look into this um, more over time and, and, and what actions we should take. But of course, in the end, it is the board of directors' uh, decision what they want to do. Uh, and and um, as we've said, that our target is to have a um, uh, net gas position between 10 to 15 percent uh, of our net sales, and, and that target uh, remains. Um, so uh, we, there's no immediate actions that that are expected, but but of course this is something that the company and the board is uh, looking over uh, over time. Did you have a follow-up, Sami? Yeah, maybe, maybe regarding uh, the gross margin at mobile networks, uh, you commented that uh, half of the improvement was not sustainable. Is that going to normalize already in the second quarter? Yeah, I would say that, uh, as we mentioned, it, it's more about retrofit and warranty and that kind of um, costs that were exceptionally low in the first quarter, and, and we expect that that uh, this should be more normalized going forward. Thanks, Simon. We'll take our next question from Simon Leopold from Remy James. Simon, please go ahead. Thank you very much for taking the question. I wanted to see if you could uh, talk a little bit about the diversification efforts. You, you didn't update us this quarter, I think, on um, the, the portion of revenue coming from enterprises and, and other non-telcos. And, and within that, um, if you could uh, elaborate on your expectations for how particularly the, the web scale uh, could develop, if you could envision um, – your switching business um, contributions there are getting bigger than optical and routing. Thank you. Well, this is this is not a negative comment about optical and routing in any way, but uh, but uh, we absolutely target to grow the switching business as quickly uh, as possible. But of course, uh, when you deal with a large, especially with the large web scalers, it takes time with these customers to ramp up uh, uh, volumes. But uh, that business is clearly ramping uh, as we speak, and it is uh, it is ramping based on some real deals that we have with these uh, uh, customers. In general, um, the non-CSP business, which is uh, which is the part of share of which we intend to grow, uh, we had also in that uh, segment, customer segment, uh, uh, good order intake growth in uh, Q1. Uh, much better orders than in Q1 last year. And uh, we do expect uh, that when we look at the full year, that the double-digit uh, top-line growth uh, will continue in the non-CSP segment. Do you have a follow-up, Simon? Yeah, just a, a brief follow-up. Um, I, I know it's, it's a gradual transition, but any updates you can offer in terms of um, displacements of, of Huawei, particularly in, in Europe, has there been progress there? Thank you. Yes, it is. It is. It is gradual uh, progress. Uh, so it's uh, difficult to give you any kind of overnight uh, changes or anything like that. But uh, but in typically 
Chinese vendors account 20 to 30 percent in markets outside of China, outside of the U.S., um, of course. Um, we estimate that uh, last year um, in mobile networks and network infrastructure, um, the Chinese vendors have roughly or had roughly 12 billion in sales outside of uh, uh, China and uh, about half, which is 6 billion of that in Europe. And uh, this is obviously an ongoing discussion in several European countries um, that uh, how they should deal with uh, that question. But uh, gradually, the importance of this opportunity for us is, is, uh, is continuing to grow. Thanks, Simon. We'll take our next question from Richard Kramer from Moretti. Richard, please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. Um, you know, Peck, I appreciate this might be a difficult question, but when we look at MN sales, uh, they're down by about a third, but R&D is actually up um, and, you know, remaining well over 500 million euros in your guidance is for a low single digit margin. How, how do you potentially reduce exposure over time to MN given what's going to be a lower margin profile for that business and reduce scale? Is there any way to bring down that R&D expenditure while remaining competitive, or is that just simply going to be the lower margin portion of your business for the foreseeable future? Well, obviously, when we are, uh, when we are implementing our cost reductions, uh, and you remember what we announced on a group level um, after Q3, 800 to 1,200 million uh, cost reduction, I think we said that about 60% of that would be mobile networks, uh, but clearly implemented in such a way that uh, we would always protect R&D output, uh, because that is crucial. Uh, we are not going to. Uh, let the situation repeat itself where we were behind our competition in 5G competitiveness in the early stages of 5G. Now we have caught up and we intend to stay in that lead when we gradually develop towards uh, 5G advanced and then 6G. So that is something that we will always protect. But having said that, of course, there are always ways to improve R&D productivity. And uh, that is something that we are investing heavily on uh, and uh, with pretty good results. Uh, I mean, we have been able to increase our R&D output uh, um, and productivity with fairly stable uh, R&D uh, investment. And this is something that we expect to continue in the future. I'm not saying exactly where the R&D volume in terms of euros in MN will be in the future through uh, AI uh, with uh, uh, co-pilots uh, uh, for uh, software programmers, et cetera, there is a real case for improving software uh, R&D productivity. And of course, we will uh, seek to take maximum advantage uh, of these opportunities as well. Did you have a follow-up okay, question? Yeah, yeah, very quickly, um, you know, for Marco, you're coming up uh, at, at the end of June uh, to uh, sort of uh, the extended contractual re agreement with um, Nokia Shanghai Bell. Um, can you give us a sense by, by the time you report next time, you'll have to have concluded that where where you're going to stand with respect to that, um, the potential liabilities and, and how you expect that to play out with the with that longstanding asset you've had in China? Yeah, this is something that, that uh, of course, we will discuss with our counterparty in, in China as well. And, and um, whenever we have any news, we will inform you about this. Thanks, Richard. We'll take our next question from Joseph Zhu from Barclays. Joseph, please go ahead. Thank you for taking my questions. Uh, and the first one is, uh, can you quantify how much of the 37% organic sales decline in mobile networks? or the 40% in North America for that division was really driven by the impact of the, the AT&T deal? Yeah, thank you, Joseph. Um, uh, the North America, uh, as a whole, we saw weakness in quarter one, and, and um, uh, there's not any specific customer that, that this is uh, uh, directed to. And what comes to AT&T, uh, we don't have any any update. What come, comes to the contractual discussions and negotiations that we have with them right now is still ongoing, and and whenever we conclude, we will 
uh, inform you about that as well. And um, exactly how, how the rest of the year will will develop in North America, uh, we follow that very carefully as well. And and um, and then um, uh, remember that that uh, AT and T continues to be a very important customer for Nokia as a group, but also for mobile networks. They continue to to sell other services to um, AT and T like uh, Femto, Microwave, and and um, and some other services as well going forward. Did you have a, a follow-up, Joseph? Yes, just my second question is just basically on China, and there has been some recent news about the government um, is kind of uh, stripping out the foreign chips from the the, the, um, the telecom equipment. And uh, as I understand, all your chips are, are foreign chips. I mean, coming from the likes of Malware, Intel, Broadcom, etc. And does it mean your China sales will? That there's a risk that your China sales go to very minimal, and and also have you seen any impact from that in Q1 at all, or, or was it mostly just like the government box? No, no, we have we have not seen any impact of that, and I have to say that we still need more clarity around that uh, uh, statement because uh, uh, there are so so called foreign chips in pretty much all parts of all networks. Uh, so it, it's very hard to see that what that would mean in practice. So we need more clarity about about that. But important for us is is to of course remember that uh, that uh, our market share in China is uh, fairly uh, low, and uh, China accounts only mainland China accounts only for a low single digit percentage of our sales. Thanks, Joseph. We'll take our next question from Sandeep Deshpande from JP Morgan. Sandeep, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for letting me on. I have a question on uh, the growth of your routing and switches business in the enterprise and where you are at this point there in terms of design with activity. There was a lot of design with activity in this business a year or slightly more than a year ago, but it seems to have uh, not been followed up to some extent. So maybe I'd like to hear on that business. And then I have a follow up on the mobile business itself. Uh, now, when uh, with the loss of the U.S. customers, uh, I mean, you are clearly thinking about the mobile business in the long term. Uh, clearly, you have a strategy for 2026, but is there a strategy beyond? Does this business have to go back and get back to U.S. customers, or is this that is going to be remain a subscale business for you, uh, or there is some other strategy to make it a much more profitable business? Okay. Thank you, Sandeep. The web scale customers first. There, there are some <coughs> undisclosed uh, deals that we are working on to uh, implement uh, and ramp up uh, at the moment. Hopefully, we would soon be able to uh, able to publish who these guys um, are. So, um, so that one is uh, uh, ramping, and uh, we continue to believe that uh, uh, switching for web scalers uh, will be a key growth driver in our non-CSP growth, not only for, for NI, but for, for Nokia as a whole. Then uh, when it comes to mobile networks uh, in the US, uh, absolutely our target is to, is to maximize our market position there in the mid to, mid to long term. And uh, we believe that, uh, that uh, our offering is strong. Uh, we have nothing to be ashamed of there. And of course, AT&T has confirmed that the reason for the decision was not the strength of our offering. So absolutely, we plan to uh, fight back. And when it comes to mobile networks in North America, in general, of course, one thing is the is the big three operators. Then there is uh, tier two and tier three as well. But then, in addition to that, there is a growing private wireless business in North America that we are doing with uh, several of our partners. And then, in addition to all of this, there is um, there is the uh, in the mid to long term significant potential uh, with the defense industry that is considering to start taking commercial technologies that five G into the um, military uh, applications, including uh, tactical uh, use. So these are all important drivers for most uh, mobile networks uh, in North America. Uh, 
absolutely we are not uh, going to be happy and settle with the market position that we currently have there. Thank you, Sandeep. We'll take our next question from Jacob Bluestone from BMP Paribas Exam. Jacob, please go ahead. Thanks for taking the question. I had a question and a quick follow-up after. Um, just on the uh, optical network side, uh, where you struck a, a more cautious tone, just be interested in hearing what is behind that um, and what is sort of the time frame you're thinking about a recovery happening there. Exact time frame is difficult to uh, say. I, we commented that it seems to be happening a little bit slower than we um, thought earlier. At the same time, when we commented that the fixed network seems to be recovering a bit uh, uh, faster. So these two would, in a way, balance uh, each other uh, out. Uh, we had uh, uh, book to bill uh, in optical networks that was above one uh, in Q1. So uh, it is contributing to the increasing order, uh, book, order backlog uh, of NI. Uh, we also have ex especially tough comparables in optical networks compared to Q1 23 when we, especially in that business, recovered from uh, the supply chain uh, bottlenecks. We had, uh, if you remember, we had 45% growth uh, in optical in Q1 last year. So that's the comparables that we are facing. On the product side, uh, uh, we are highly confident that, uh, that we are in a good place. Our new PSC 6 uh, and 6S platforms continue to pick up momentum. We have several new customers uh, uh, there uh, doing trials, uh, we are delivering best-in-class performance. We had, you may have seen our recent announcement with uh, Surfnet. So again, highly confident on the product uh, side, and uh, clearly everything we are seeing in in AI and uh, cloud compute will drive investments uh, into data centers, into data center fabric itself, which of course will benefit switching, and then the data center interconnects, which will benefit the optical. And again, the big advantage that we have compared to, I would say, anyone else uh, is that we have scale both in IP and optical. So depending on, regardless of how operators want to play this architectural game that what you are doing uh, in the network on the optical layer and what you are doing on the IP layer, we will have uh, an answer to their needs. Thanks for that. If I could just also ask a quick follow-up. Uh, I think you made a comment earlier that you expected that Q1 was the low point for North American mobile networks revenues uh, as well as Indian. So just, just make sure I got that right. So even with AT&T maybe falling out later in the year, you still expect the sort of roughly 400 million of mobile networks revenues uh, in, in North America to be the low point for the year. Yes, you are, you are correct. That's what we, that's what we said. Um, um, and uh, the AT&T situation has been taken into account in that statement. Thanks, Jacob. We'll take our next question from Felix Henriksen from Nordeo. Felix, please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I wanted to revisit the mobile networks revenue growth guidance of minus 15 to minus 10 percent for for the year and see whether or not you sort of use the uh, minus 4 percent market growth rate uh, by Delora, which are uh, primary peer called up as optimistic in, in deriving this as a basis for market growth uh, and, and sort of revisit what gives you confidence to to call out the market bottom in the in the North America for Q1, given that you must be losing volumes from the AT&T customers. Thank you. Mm. Well, obviously we are part of the same same market with our uh, Swedish friends who who made that uh, that comment and. Uh, uh, I have really nothing to add that comment. I mean, uh, we are seeing the same thing. We do expect that uh, the whole market will remain weak this year. Uh, there seems to be slightly different dynamics, uh, especially when it comes to uh, India. We had huge ramp up in India in the first uh, half of the year, which gives us extremely tough comparable, comparables, which will then help us quite a lot in the year-over-year -year comparison for the second uh, half uh, of the year. So that's why when we are combining that with the fact that we believe and this we are seeing through our order uh, backlog and, and the discussions with customers that we we believe that we saw the low point in deliveries now in Q1, both in North America and uh, and in India. That then combined with the activities in the rest 
rest of the world, uh, we are hopeful that uh, that uh, in our case, our uh, M and top line uh, would pick up uh, for the rest of the year, the remaining quarters from the level uh, in Q1. But that does not change. That does not change the fact that the full year will be weak for the whole of uh, mobile networks. And uh, when you talk about uh, our top line uh, forecast compared to uh, the Del Oro uh, forecast, of course, what needs to be kept in mind there is, uh, is really the India situation where we have a very high market share in India. And uh, when that market uh, ramps up massively and then drops significantly back to kind of more normal levels in uh, one year, obviously that is then to be reflected on our top line also and when you are comparing our top line development to whatever the global market uh, development will be. Did you have a quick follow-up, Felix? Yeah, just quickly, um, do, do you still expect to see continued free cash flow support from a decrease in receivables related to, to India in the coming quarters or has this sort of uh, networking capital profile related to, to India now, now normalized? Yeah, we, we started seeing the networking capital release uh, already in the quarter four, if you remember that, and, and continued now, um, specifically in quarter one, when it comes to uh, accounts receivables. And um, uh, then, uh, of course, uh, it it always depends a little bit um, what is the geographical or customer mix as well. Uh, but I believe that there is still potential in the working capital uh, to improve uh, exactly how what the timing is and 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 it depends also um, uh, throughout the year w w how the mix is between different geographies and, and regions but also the timing of of the revenues um, between different quarters because of course we, when you have a very heavy quarter four uh, then usually uh, that ties up uh, uh, accounts receivables towards the end of the year and, and payments coming quarter one. But we are, uh, we started the year extremely well and, and um, we believe that we are uh, in a very solid track to, to that outlook that we have when it comes to uh, free cash flow generation uh, or conversion between 30 to 60 percent. And, and remember also that quarter two, we usually are impacted by the annual variable pay uh, that that always comes in quarter two. Thanks, Felix. We'll take our final question this morning from Emil Imanen from Carnegie. Emil, please go ahead. Hi, and thank you for taking my questions. Uh, I just wanted to understand the cost savings program. Was there something already visible from that in Q1, or where sh when should we expect that to that to start to show in your results? Yeah, thank you, Emil. Uh, yeah, we, we started uh, actions immediately in October when we announced uh, the cost saving program. And, and um, um, of course, uh, usually it takes some time, but, but we start to see already in quarter one impacts of the cost saving program and, and just give you some um, uh, more facts behind this. So if you look, number of employees uh, in end of quarter one, compared to end of quarter four last year. So we've been reducing number of employees more than 2,000 people already in quarter one. So we are in, in a good, uh, I would say, uh, position to execute the expected cost savings for this year. Uh, it's totally in your savings of 500, where 400 is coming from a new program. Did you have a quick follow-up, Emil? Yeah, just on the MN side, so can you help me understand where is about the break-even point in sales for your operating profit? Yeah, we we have uh, been working with, or Mobile Networks has been uh, working on, on reducing their uh, cost base, but also what comes to a break-even point. Uh, and um, with these actions that we have been taking and, and will take in the new uh, cost saving program, the ambition level is that we will uh, reach the break-even point of top line of around 8 billion by 2026. At the same time, we also um, uh, lower uh, the 
break-even point or, or the point where we would reach double-digit operating margin, uh, which used to be 11.5, I now believe that will be taken down to 10 billion. Thank you, Emil, and thank you everyone for your questions today. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's call. I would like to mind, remind you that during the call today, we have made a number of forward-looking statements that involve risks and uncertainties. Actual results may therefore differ materially from the results currently expected. Factors that could cause such differences can be both external as well as internal operating factors. We have identified such risks in the risk factor section of our annual report on Form 20F, which is available on our investor relations website. Thank you all for joining us. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.